Good. Also to announce and ask if there are any objections to recording the session, just for the purpose of sharing this with, uh, with other folks. So if there are no objections, we will proceed. If there are, we'll figure out what to do. Never happened before. <laughs> so uh, we'll probably stop recording if there are objections. If not, uh, we'll continue introducing Antonia. Antonia uh, is a good old friend from Sane, as I said, uh, she started off, if not the first, the second academy in, in Greece is where we met back in 2015, which is now seems very, very, very far away. Uh, Antonia has done a PhD focusing on uh, the role of citizens in the energy transition uh, and has been with the REST group, the Federation of Renewable Energy Cooperatives for the past five years, right? Antonia? Or so more, officially right? three years. Officially three, okay. <laughs> Collaborating before in project though. Okay, you'll, you'll get the chance to, to, the, to tell a little bit more on that. And uh, she's going to be telling us about this, uh, both uh, these experiences, and then I can introduce Chris um, a little bit uh, later. So now over to you, Tony. I'll stop sharing. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Susanna. And indeed, uh, we met uh, back in uh, the Greek uh, Energy Academy, actually, uh, quite some years ago, so the second academy. <laughs> and I'm very happy to be here well, in this virtual uh, community uh, space again with you. Uh, I have prepared the presentation to share with you. Let me see. Uh, I hope. Yeah, I think you see this. So, indeed, as Susanna said, I'm uh, working for SCOPU, the European Federation of uh, Citizen Energy uh, Cooperatives. Um, a few words about uh, RESCOOP. Uh, so we actually were established about 10 years uh, ago. Uh, uh, we are like a stink uh, young, I would say, organization with uh, some experience that we wish to actually share and inspire people to take action. We're based in Belgium, Brussels and Antwerp. And uh, today we have about 15 people uh, staff. We represent uh, more than 1,900 energy cooperatives across Europe, uh, which translates in uh, a million uh, 250,000 uh, uh, citizens actually uh, of uh, Europe. We're a, a sector federation of cooperatives Europe, and we participate also in the International Cooperative Alliance. So I wanted to ask you, what does co what do cooperatives uh, mean to you? But I saw uh, that uh, that was the first question. I, I have the notes here. So I saw uh, you mentioned uh, share prosperity, people owning the power. So this uh, issue of ownership and democracy uh, are quite uh, strong. And uh, for us, uh, in the next slide, uh, you see that uh, as RescuePU, we understand energy cooperatives as group of citizens who jointly cooperate on energy transition projects. We don't take this very strict, let's say, approach of uh, worrying about the particular legal entity, I mean, the legal uh, uh, form that uh, the initiative will have. But for us, what is important is that these initiatives follow and respect the seven international cooperative alliance principles, the cooperative principles that you see here in the, the screen. So um, we, it's critical that cooperatives are actually open and voluntary participation uh, should be ensured. People uh, are invited to join and participate. Uh, the democratic element is indeed uh, strong, one person, one vote. Um, uh, the member economic participation refers to the fact that everyone can become a member by buying one share. We try to make this as easy as possible, actually, not having super extreme, let's say, uh, financial participation uh, as a requirement. Um, an example would be like 100 euros or 250, I think it's uh, something like that uh, often. Uh, cooperatives are actually uh, autonomous and independent organization, autonomous from uh, the other influence on the environment, but also this independence and autonomy relates to the members. So uh, the, uh, what does that mean? It means that it's only the collective that can 
participate and decide, uh, take decisions. Uh, we uh, need to ensure that um, uh, the part I mean that no particular member has uh, more power than anyone else in uh, the cooperative. Uh, cooperatives focus quite significantly on education, training, and the provision of information. This is also quite uh, critical for us because um, uh, we want to, of course, see the energy transition happening as, as fast as possible with uh, as uh, as much democracy as possible. Uh, what we often hear and what we often say is that cooperatives are actually working for the transition to energy democracy and not to the energy transition. <laughs> the energy democracy is the uh, our end goal, uh, let's say. Uh, so cooperation between uh, among cooperatives is also a key for us and in my presentation later on I will actually present some examples of this and of course what uh, is uh, the uh, base, uh, the, the key element for our operation is the concern for the community. Whatever cooperatives do, they do it exactly because they want to improve the situation of the community and uh, what type of um, uh, activities do citizen uh, energy cooperatives focus on? Uh, I have here on the slide uh, the list, production, supply, distribution. There is a lot of different things that the cooperatives can do. And I will be again uh, getting back to this with my presentation. There's a lot of opportunities uh, nowadays. Um, why do I say nowadays? Because in fact, a couple of years ago, uh, we had like the shift to uh, a new landscape uh, in the energy system. And specifically, I can uh, refer to uh, uh, that I can reflect that I'm sorry. I can refer to the uh, moment in time, uh, May 2019, where the you know, European Union, actually the institutions, concluded the uh, legislative files for the clean energy for all Europeans uh, package, uh, the clean energy package, we uh, refer to it, uh, which was uh, envisioned as the goal, I mean, as the means to meet uh, its uh, 2030 climate and energy objectives. So this uh, legal uh, tool was there uh, to that um, it was critical the moment for us because it was the first time that in fact uh, the um, city the role of the citizen was acknowledged in the uh, context of the energy transition. Uh, we have now a set of basic rights for the participation of citizens in the uh, energy transition. Uh, we can call for the uh, enabling framework. Uh, we are still <laughs> calling for the, this uh, introduction of the enabling uh, framework or the improvement, let's say, of this uh, where this has been uh, introduced. Um, and there's a lot of things to say. I, I like this kind of uh, visualization that uh, our uh, president Dirk van Sinjan often uh, uses. Uh, that we see actually that we have not only a new player in the um, uh, game, but you actually see that we have uh, managed to transform the uh, playing field. So where we used to have authorities, maybe legal, uh, I mean, uh, municipal authorities or public authorities, and then the market, the business uh, sector. Now we have the communities. We have uh, us uh, citizens, organized citizens working together to contribute to the energy transition. And uh, another visual that uh, I would like to use here is the just to contrast where we were and where we're going um, from a very uh, centralized system of fossil fuel, you know, plants. Uh, we now working towards a future that we have many uh, uh, pro smaller producers and some bigger as well, <laughs> a combination and a lot of different things happening in a more decentralized manner. Uh, instead of having uh, the large power plants uh, Transferring, transmitting energy via uh, 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 power lines and pipelines, we wish to see more like uh, small scale transmission and regional supply. There is also a shift when it comes to the distribution. Instead of having like this kind of traditional top to bottom, now we will have a bi-directional actually uh, distribution of uh, energy. And of course, key is the fact that uh, for the citizen, a citizen is going to stop being just a passive, let's say, a participant in this uh, world. We're going to move more towards the active participation and uh, of the citizen 
for the citizen to take advantage also of this opportunity. So only very few words about the context, what was happening back in 2018 and 2019. Uh, with the uh, clean energy package, we had the introduction of uh, the citizen energy communities, a legal entity, open and voluntary participation. You can see, you can read that it's very close to the cooperative principles and the renewable energy communities, which have some additional, uh, let's say, uh, criteria. They need to be autonomous and they need to be in the proximity of the renewable energy project. But I don't want us to get lost on the legal framework. What we need to keep is that it's a about the how. So also these uh, uh, definitions, if you look at them, they focus on the how and not a, they don't focus on the what. Because as I said in the beginning, the initiatives can do a lot of things. Um, why do we have these two definitions? Well, mostly thanks to uh, Brussels uh, chaotic processes that they were like two processes working in parallel. So the citizen energy communities were developed in the context of uh, the electricity directive and the renewable energy uh, communities were uh, developed in the context of the uh, recast of uh, re uh, red uh, the renewable energy di directive. Um, a lot of things, new things. I'm going to move on. I also uh, said this, that we see the link between the the definition and the cooperative principle. Uh, it's a, it was a quite happy moment, of course, when this uh, thing happened for us. Uh, I, at this point, I wanted to ask you, I don't have apologies, I don't have a metimeter uh, uh, prepared, but I would like to ask you, uh, what is the added value that you see that energy communities can, act, uh, can add uh, in the system and overall the energy transition? Maybe just if you would like to uh, either write on the chat or just um, raise your hand and uh, say a few words about this. Yeah, I can, I can open up the mic and speak yeah. up. Yeah, exactly. Our participants from the academy uh, this week have, have talked about it, so I guess that must be fresh in your, in your <laughs> minds. <laughs> Anyone? Um, we have uh, Ugo. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, answer to, to your question, the, um, mm -hmm. the value I, I see is basically we not uh, lost any kind of energy uh, between the places products, producted mm -hmm. to the, the place should uh, power the, the community, should, should arrive. Um, and we can have uh, every time exists some uh, blackdown, uh, mm -hmm. blackout, I think blackout, blackout. Uh, is the correct, okay. yes, blackout, uh, the affected area could be shorter. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we we have big parts of the city uh, blackout because have some problem in the distribution, etc. So we can redox this, uh, these impacts. Indeed, indeed, good both uh, good points, and I see also Chris. <laughs> uh, he will be sharing uh, later more. Moving energy system beyond profit to social ecological purposes. Exactly, that's also uh, quite important. That the main target of the initiatives is actually indeed to improve, as we said, uh, the condition for the local community, so uh, social ecological purposes. Um, and with this, I would like to move us to the next part to see, okay, so we see what is the added value. Now let's see how, <laughs> some examples of how different initiatives across Europe actually uh, develop uh, these projects that offer this uh, value. You can see here in the, the map, a lot of different initiatives uh, across Europe. This is from our Rescue EU map, uh, the network. You can uh, go and check it yourself. And if you click, you get also more information I mean, you get the link for you to get more information about the initiative. Uh, I'll start my, my story, let's say, by uh, the Netherlands, from the Netherlands. Uh, I'm a bit biased because actually I did research in the Netherlands and these initiatives were some of the initiatives that I was studying. Uh, so one example is the example of Zouderlicht. 
it's a cooperative that focuses mostly on developing uh, solar projects, although they also have now participation in a wind project, uh, in uh, local buildings, mostly they go for schools. Uh, they uh, use the opportunity of uh, developing some uh, solar PVs on the uh, roof of the uh, school, uh, for example, um, and then they provide the electricity uh, partly uh, can go to the local, the, the particular school, but also some members of this cooperative can also have access to this uh, electricity. Um, and also by doing this, they also focus on actually organizing a lot of events to discuss about the model of developing this kind of solar projects, what is the benefit of energy cooperatives, how can we empower, how we can be self-empowered actually. There's nobody empowering someone else. We, by getting active, uh, we feel the power we have uh, through this uh, example of participating in the energy transition. The other example is the example of Delta Vint, um, where they actually have um, a great plants, uh, both solar and uh, wind. Now I have there in the picture the example of uh, the wind park, uh, wind park Kramer, uh, where they have collaborated with another cooperative, Delta Vint partnered with uh, Zeu Vint. Uh, in total, the two co-ops have about 4,000 members. And by joining forces, they managed to develop uh, this uh, power plant, I mean, this uh, wind uh, park of uh, 34 wind turbines, uh, raising up to 100 megawatt capacity, which is something that might be like uh, impossible to imagine. But joining forces, the cooperatives managed to uh, make it a reality. This plan can actually uh, empower uh, more than uh, 100,000 uh, consumers. Um, leaving the Netherlands, moving to Belgium, we have a lot of examples where we see the collaboration also between the local uh, initiative, citizen initiative with the municipality as well. One example is the example of EcoPower, one of the uh, oldest and biggest uh, cooperatives, I think, in Europe. I can say. Um, and uh, the example that I love sharing is this example of the collaboration with, uh, of EcoPower with Amel and Bullingen, where uh, it's a municipality, where the municipality actually uh, had uh, the space, they wanted to develop a wind project, and they uh, made citizen participation a prerequisite in the tender. And uh, uh, EcoPower actually applied, submitted an offer, and they managed to get uh, this uh, uh, space to develop uh, a project. And now they have 50% ownership goes to the citizens participating in EcoPower, and 50% goes to the ownership of the municipalities. Again, of course, this goes citizen via the municipality. So again, it's about local ownership. Um, very quickly about the other two examples I have there, we have the example of uh, Pio Power, uh, where the cooperative uh, supported the municipality of Halle uh, in the replacement of uh, public light. They turned it to uh, the traditional lighting to LED, and in fact, they they gave the loan to the municipality for this action. Often we see that the municipality gives a loan to the community of citizens, but in this case, we have the reverse. And in, in Boven, we see that the focus is on also on uh, heating. So they're developing a cooperative district heating network, collaboration of the cooperative with the local municipality. Uh, we're going south. <laughs> you, I'm sure you know uh, Copernico. And I guess you know also your neighbors, uh, Soma Energia. Uh, I have these initiatives uh, together because they're also like back in 2010, um, uh, Spain, in Spain, uh, uh, we had the establishment of Soma Energia, and now is actually one of the, the biggest uh, cooperative in the country and one of the biggest in the EU. Uh, you can see the numbers about the capacity and the membership, but I like having these two together because, in fact, Copernico was inspired, and I think that there was some exchange and communication by uh, Soma Energia, and Copernico uh, emerged in Portugal back. Uh, 10 years ago, actually, and uh, the cooperative uh, keeps on developing new projects. Uh, you see a capacity and members we have. I will get back to Copernico later on. Another example that I wanted to mention is the example from Spain, uh, the example of Xenergia. 
where uh, what I love about this example is uh, apart from the fact that uh, we see uh, that is uh, as you can see in the pictures there like uh, women participating uh, in uh, the cooperative it's a female cooperative they got support from NGOs and another uh, cooperative that I said cooperative supports another cooperative again this is some energy uh, what I love is that they actually do the installment of the PVs themselves because we see that sometimes, yes, uh, the participation means like I buy a share, maybe I can present here and there in some events, but here we're talking about the installation. It's uh, quite uh, inspiring. Um, in Ireland, uh, another example, uh, we have the example of, uh, oh, and I see that time goes fast. I will <laughs> try, I will share all the slides with you afterwards uh, for you to take a look. Um, but I will just say that in Ireland, we have the project uh, of uh, Energy Communities uh, Tipperary, the cooperative, that they actually focus on uh, community led home insulation and upgrade and retrofit so when it comes also to the con uh, consumption we do have a uh, knowledge in the community i mean of energy cooperatives and uh, we're happy to share more about this in fact we also have a new working group <laughs> on the particular topic of um, citizen-led uh, renovation um very shortly it's not only production, it's not only consumption, it's also mobility. We need to start thinking also about how do we, you know, uh, take care of other uh, areas that we need the uh, energy for. The example of Partago, collaboration with Ghent. And uh, they have actually this uh, five, uh, the collaboration of five neighborhoods. They have uh, the cars and the digital sharing uh, platform of the cars. And here they reached out, uh, Coopstrom reached out to them uh, to get some knowledge. They had started with solar, uh, but then they went, uh, maybe I want to also involve, uh, I mean, uh, get involved. The cooperative wants to get involved in uh, mobility as well. So they reached out. And they learned from Partago what to do. And now they have these 23 cars. But they said between in the morning, the civil servants have access to these cars. And in the evening and the weekend, it's the members of the co-op. So we see quite interesting way to also share these uh, vehicles. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, this, we also have the mobility factory that they focus, actually, it's a cooperative society that they focus on this, on how we can support the development of more uh, projects on uh, cooperative uh, mobility, sustainable mobility. Again, quickly, just I want you to take a look at this uh, wonderful uh, car, <laughs> caravan, uh, that uh, Bio Power used to attract the attention of the citizens so that the citizens come to check what is this, so that they can start discussing about uh, how they can actually save energy. Uh, this is uh, one of the tools that they used. Um, uh, in uh, Brixton Solar, they also focus a lot on training and they, in uh, uh, different uh, communities that they are in val vulnerable uh, condition, they try to uh, involve them and they tell them, okay, you can invest a tiny amount of uh, money and then we can also give you some electricity, of course, more than what they paid. Of course, they uh, support them just to show them that uh, what they can do. And of course, there's a lot of training to uh, help them become um, themselves able to save uh, also uh, electricity and energy overall. Cooperative models, I will skip, apologies for an ERCOP, and I will go directly to Copernico, uh, <laughs> because it's a similar uh, situation where we have um, the members of the community actually in, in short, uh, paying a little bit uh, uh, more or supporting, in fact, uh, each other. So in the case of uh, Copernico, uh, they enabled some of the member, their members to borrow from uh, uh, other members in low interest rate so that they can actually uh, take on uh, some uh, energy uh, efficiency measures or renewable energy production um, equipment. Um, this is a model that has actually been awarded. Um, uh, another example from uh, Portugal is the example of Culatra Comunidad Energética Sostentável. Apologies for my attempt to speak Portuguese. Uh, that uh, they also uh, emerged as an initiative um, 
about four years ago or three, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in fact, Susanna was also supporting in, at some point one of the workshops that, with the community. Mm -hmm. And um, the next slides, uh, just from the different projects, you can click on the slides overall, like these wonderful videos, but I don't have the time for you to see because they also have this kind of uh, project to also solarize uh, the marine transport. Uh, next level, let's say, of activity. Uh, and then if I go to the next, okay, also projects, of course, at the solar projects and energy efficiency uh, on the roof. Last uh, area of development that I wanted to focus is the example of uh, uh, um, the initiatives actually organizing to also invest in offshore wind. Uh, this is an example of CCOP uh, here in uh, Belgium, uh, where the different initiatives actually joined forces, different cooperatives, to uh, be able to, develop, to participate in the tender and take part uh, of um, the ownership, I mean, take ownership of part of the uh, wind project that will be developed. So we're talking about um, I think in total, uh, um, more than 30, I don't recall exact number, of uh, federations and energy cooperatives that actually uh, join to be able to participate uh, in offshore wind. And then my uh, slide here is I want to invite you and then I'm going to skip the next slide because there's only a, a lot of information on what you can learn. But here I wanted to check with you. Um, which one uh, do you think that is one of these two uh, community, I mean, initiatives are uh, a, an energy uh, community? Um, the first one is uh, a citizen owned PV production. They focus on a citizen owned PV production on a school, Etoile Solaire. Um, it's in uh, France. And the second one, uh, I think is in the Netherlands, is a collective uh, self-consumption with PV and battery. So if you think that, that these two projects, so if you think that the first one is uh, an energy community, uh, I invite you to just uh, add the reaction like the like, uh, use the reactions from Zoom. And then if you think the second, uh, Sarah Hart. Let me see how I can see your reactions. Ah, la la. I don't, uh, I have to they, say. They then okay. disappear after a bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. I see. I see that, uh, okay. So far. <laughs> yeah, I see like some people clapping. <laughs> but that's indeed, I see the shift. Perfect. I, I'm happy to see that indeed the first example is the uh, energy community because we're talking about the citizen approach the ownership and the real participation while the second one is a nice project renewables but not necessarily uh, uh, in the spirit of um, energy communities that aim for the empowerment of the local community of course you see community there i'm sure chris has to say uh, some things about uh, this uh, misuse i will leave it here of uh, the community community washing but uh, yeah so just to show you what you have in on the slide that you will receive check uh, the movie that we have Check uh, also the website of the Energy Communities Repository, a lot of material. Uh, check our website. We have a lot of publications also in uh, Portuguese. Uh, you see now in the context of a previous project, we have also a MOOC that you can share, see different videos of uh, people involved in energy uh, communities, energy cooperatives, uh, mentioned in Portuguese as well, different guidebooks. And I think, yes, this is double. Materials also when it comes to the collaboration with the municipality. All this you will receive, the slides. I have the links on the at the bottom. And I think this is the, yes, this is my very last slide. Thank you very much. I apologize, I spoke too much. Um, yeah, I hope that I didn't uh, lose you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. Uh, now it was super interesting. I, I learned a bunch today, so well done. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think we can open up for a few questions and then at the end uh, some more. So if you can turn on your camera, that would be nice as well. So we have some human interaction as well, even if we're 
far and distant. If you can't, that's fine. Uh, I would invite you to just um, ask any questions to, to Antonia or put my comments. As I said, as Antonia said, the, the slides will be shared and this, the recording will be shared. So the information uh, is there, but if there's any questions now. Yes, it's or comments, or, or we comments. can also discuss later. I'm happy to. Hmm. I saw just one question here on the chat. I think the boast that Anna refers to is probably relating to uh, the question, the test that you exactly. asked. Yeah, exactly. and I think, a, I think it's a relevant question. So maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe I guess we can take that. And then we have Hugo. Yes, so both, uh, both. Uh, I don't know if Anna, you want to raise? I think, I'm, I, I don't know, Anna, if you can speak or yeah. uh, feel free to. Yeah, exactly. I, I can speak now, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so you said both. Uh, did you mean the, um, both both uh, uh, um, initiatives are can be considered community energy? Is that what you yes, mean? yes, yes. I think so. Yes. Okay. I see. I see the question. That is a, is, it's it's a very relevant. Tanya, did you get? Did you get it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So the thing is that indeed there the uh, the the issue is that. While the project was sustainable, renewable energy and all, it's contributing to the transition, but I'm not sure how far uh, they actually involve the citizen in the decision making. Uh, I'm not sure what are they doing with the benefit because I didn't have the time to mention, but often we see that when an initiative has some financial also benefit, because while the environmental and social benefits are the key driver, sometimes we also have financial benefits. And what we often see is that uh, the whatever kind of savings or uh, income is generating, uh, it is reinvested in a project for the community and it doesn't need to be a renewable energy project it can be a project that has i don't know um upgrading uh, or um, let me use another word not to, to confuse with energy upgrade but uh, let's say a, a, a project for the local um, a community house uh, the a project for a, a neighboring a neighborhood uh, farm you know, we've seen this actually uh, in uh, different initiatives, like uh, the ones that I presented. But uh, I think Hugo had, if I remember correctly, a question. Yes, yes, I have a, a question. Uh, it's a standard question from another um, uh, another uh, meetings we have. My question is, if this kind of projects are really sustainable, uh, because if we have uh, small communities with solar panels and batteries in lithium and all materials is need, all infrastructure is need, of course, it will be more sustainable because uh, we buy the solar light, etc., etc. But all sand and uh, rare lands is needed for, for do these materials. The life period of the batteries, the life periods of the panels, at the end will be ecological, uh, ve um, eco uh, sustainable, ah, sorry, uh, I forgot the, the words, but will be 100% uh, ecological in cooperation if we have a bigger uh, station to provide energy to small communities uh, around. The, the thing what we, uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for the question. And indeed that's something that uh, uh, a question or a comment that emerges and I'm also always happy to uh, address it because what we try to do with the cooperatives is to not only address the issue of the production, but also uh, the issue of the consumption. I think that uh, any kind of technology has an impact, a negative <laughs> impact, uh, on the uh, environment, but we always need to take care of, you know, the cost and benefit balance. And uh, what we say is that uh, the projects develop uh, with the community approach, the energy community, the energy cooperatives uh, approach, have always the consideration for the improvement of the condition of the local community. But uh, there are arguments about, you know, why decentralized energy production is actually better. Uh, we discussed it earlier than centralized. But the other thing that I wanted to mention also is that uh, 
it is very important, and I see more and more communities doing this uh, already, to start discussing a, a lot, uh, a bit, not only about the energy efficiency, so the technological, let's say, a gain of um, um, on the consumption side, you know, to reducing part of the consumption thanks to uh, technolo uh, technology fix, but to start a little bit changing our perspective on our patterns, on the things that we do, on the habits, on um, the overall, you know, to take the extra mile to, for example, the classic example is to wear the, that jumper, you know, don't turn <laughs> on the radiator, just wear the jumper and, and uh, move on. Or like, um, be, but even I would say that we need to go beyond the jumper <laughs> because moving beyond the jumper is maybe a bit radical, but I was inspired. We were recently in a study trip in uh, Vienna and I will say that we visited one uh, co-housing project that um, they had the renewable uh, production, you know, how high insulated and all. But what I liked from this project is that they also had, uh, for instance, certain spaces that were shared with the community. So we, they were limiting, let's say, the space that they were uh, taking. Uh, then, And that meant that overall the consumption was actually reduced because of the fact that particular spaces were shared. So you don't need to uh, have an extra big, let's say, uh, a living room or a super comfortable, uh, let's say, um, uh, how to say, a place for a workshop, for cutting, I don't know, painting or whatever. If you start sharing with other people, the energy need is going to be reduced. So this is, we need to start thinking beyond the efficiency. That's uh, what I think that it's uh, critical for us to, you know, to use like some kind of academic uh, lingo, uh, we need more social innovation than technological innovation. I would say both is what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antoniana. Any more questions? Now is the time or maybe maybe after. after Happy to continue. Okay. Thank Okay, then maybe uh, we can we can save some for. I also have lots of questions, but in the in the interest of time, let's move on and maybe leave it for uh, for the end. Uh, so now we'll end it over to our, our next speaker. Uh, Chris is now working with Brescoop, uh, the European Federation of Energy Cooperatives that Antonia is also representing here. Uh, he also works for Electro Energy Cooperative, which is a social enterprise that promotes active engagement of citizens in room with energy production in Greece and the Balkans. Um, so maybe Chris, you can say a bit more about yourself. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, I know it's the end of the day, so uh, I'll try to be um, quick and engaging. Uh, and just to say a big thanks uh, to Susanna and Katerina for inviting us today. I will more speak with my hat of Electra Energy and not so much the, the rest of hat because what I'm going to do with this presentation is I'll um, present to you what we do as an organization, but also give you some tips and tricks based on my experience with an energy community that I'm a member of in Athens. So um, as Electra, we are supporting various energy communities in Greece and beyond. And one of the first energy communities we started with, let's say, our baby is Hyperion. And through this example, I'll, um, I'll share my story today. And just to say my beginning and the end of the presentation, I think is a good link that I'm after Andornia because I always think that the, the community work uh, but also relating that to the European work is, is how we need to be thinking. Uh, it's not just the individual. It's really uh, it's going beyond that neoliberal thinking of, uh, you know, you need to use paper straws and you need to recycle, but really working with your community and then going beyond the community and trying to affect the national as well as the, the European. Um, let me start. So I... You should be able to see the slides now. Um, just a very quick snapshot of Electra Energy, the organization that I'm working for. It's, it was founded in 2016, but really it's been very active and operational since 2021. So for the past two years, what we've been doing is we've been promoting energy democracy in Greece, the Balkans, and more and more all over Europe. 
In fact, together with Rescue BU, we co-hosted the two uh, last pan-European spring gatherings where more than 200 people from across Europe, including Moldova, Ukraine, Turkey, um, Bosnia, generally the Western Balkans, so all of the, let's say, Eurozone uh, countries uh, attended. Um, and what we do is we network. We're in the process of creating a national cluster of energy communities. We offer capacity building and, of course, awareness raising our, around the topic of energy democracy. And lately, we're getting more and more into the uh, topics of advocacy. So we've been reacting to the ongoing Repower EU uh, process. I don't know how many of you know what that is. It's, it's a process of basically updating the energy efficiency and renewable energy targets uh, at um, the national level. Uh, we've created a, a manifesto in light of the municipal elections that are happening this Saturday, this Sunday in Greece, but also in light of the European elections that are happening in June. And of course, we're trying to uh, set a tone of work that is more and more intersectional. So as Adonia was telling before, it's not just about producing and consuming energy, but about really reaching out to all sorts of other groups, feminist groups, LGBT groups, refugee groups, and um, uh, making these synergies, making these alliances, and seeing how we, be, we become more sustainable holistically, not just in the energy field. Um, I want you to have a, a look at these three pictures. I will describe them because I know it's a lot of information. And then through um, a Mentimeter that I will send now in the chat, I would like you to um, share how, what these um, pictures make you feel. So just to read them out, we have this uh, report by Oxfam that shows the carbon inequality based on wealth. And you can really see how the bottom 50% of the global population emits almost nothing, <laughs> emits uh, less than 20% uh, uh, of global emissions. And then you see when you get really to the very top 10% of the global uh, wealthy, they emit almost all of the carbon budget. And then there's the headline on the right. This is a very new article from The Guardian that shows this new service from a private jet um, company that is offering uh, people flights from Dubai to London with private jets that they can take their pets on. They can pe take their pets in the private jet for a flight from London to Dubai. And then in the bottom, we see another very concerning phenomenon, which is the rise of the far right. And of course, it's not just in Germany, but it's very concerning when it happens in Germany considering the, the historical past and the European significance and how this is linked to the ongoing um, heating law that was proposed in Germany to replace fossil gas boilers there. Uh, I would like you to use the, the Mentimeter that I sent you to... Um, <laughs> I love the... There is already one emoji, uh, but please uh, use the link and... Uh, let let us know what these three um, stories together make you feel. We're already kind of seeing um, lack of touch with reality, insanity, confusion, that it's mad. We're feeling mad of all this capitalism. I love it. Disappointed, disgust. I think we're more or less all, al all aligned that... Um, what we're seeing is actually uh, a concurrent breakdown in uh, climate, in clim in terms of the climate crisis, but also rising socioeconomic inequalities. And the problem here, and what I really wanted to to emphasize with this slide, and sorry, I will go back to the slide. So, is that. Um, really what governments need to do, what civil society needs to do, what we as citizens need to do is to come up with climate solutions that are both climate just, but also socially just. Because if we keep letting people ride their private jets with their pets from London to Dubai, but at the same time, we tell everyday people that they cannot use their car or they cannot use their fossil boiler, this is going to keep um, contributing to a rise of the far right. It's going to keep contributing to a rise in populism. So we really need to be emphasizing the power of socially and climate just solutions. And this is uh, what we believe in uh, Electra and uh, also Rescue PU that energy communities are uh, a solution that embodies both of these elements. 
And with this, I take you into the story of Hyperion, actually one of the first energy communities that was found, founded in Greece back in uh, 2020, officially. It's a not-for-profit energy community. It currently has about 120 members. Most of them are uh, physical persons, but we also have some NGOs with their offices, some small and medium-sized businesses. And we have a big diversity of members, accountants, activists, lawyers, all sorts of people. And that's what gives power really to the community. And we really try to engage in co-creation and community building processes, not just, again, what Adonia was saying, not just put a solar park, but really emphasize the sense of community, meet up in the park, exchange gifts, get to know each other, build a community. Um, and I guess my first tip, <laughs> again, uh, thinking back to our experience with Hyperion, is that when you start your first steps as an energy community, you should find that core team of people, this three to five, that's usually the, the golden number of people that are really the visionaries, the ones that will push uh, the narrative forward, that will inspire other people to join the community. Uh, emphasize the different uh, messages that resonate with different audience, uh, audiences. Actually, together with Rescoop, we have been doing this project where we've been mapping the social impact of energy communities, know all sorts of environmental, social, and economic benefits that they bring. And it's about tailoring your message and seizing the narrative. Like, for example, now with the energy crisis, one thing we've been doing with Electra and with Hyperion, the energy community, is that we've been saying to people, this is unfair. These are, these are large corporations that are making money off of you. And we need to be producing our own energy because this, this is the only way we become energy independent and secure a fair energy future. Of course, uh, we saw very early on in uh, Hyperion that it's about delegating roles. Uh, we saw that to run a successful energy community, we needed at least one person with legal background, engineering background, project manager and coordinator, and of course, someone that can keep up the social engagement to make sure that you know the members are activated, they are engaged, they know what's going on, uh, and so on. And this is very important when running a community project that you assign the roles equally to share the burden. Um, scoping the legal framework is quite important. I know that uh, in Portugal, there's still quite a lot of, um, there are efforts uh, around uh, energy sharing locally and so on, but there, it's still not a super favorable, favorable framework. But I guess uh, maybe Suzanne, you can tell us more later, but I think that's slowly changing, right? Um, so really looking at uh, what are the available legal forms for your, for your community. Adonia mentioned that usually uh, energy communities take the legal form of cooperatives because these align well with the idea of voluntary and open participation, of one member, one vote, of, of all of these things. And this is also uh, the type of energy communities we have in, in Greece. Uh, all energy communities in Greece are by law cooperatives, so they are run uh, like cooperatives, which is very easy to understand because the cooperative law, you know, it sets out the rules. There's a general assembly, there's a board of directors, and that's how the energy community is run. Uh, and linked to the legal framework is, of course, the regulatory framework. In Greece, we have a quite favorable framework, which also explains why there's tens and tens of energy communities every day growing across the country. And what we have is called, is called collective self-consumption, where um, Adonia kind of explained the model earlier through uh, some, uh, for example, the community in the Netherlands. But basically, you, you install a collective solar park, let's say, somewhere. It can be outside of the city. That's the case for Hyperion, our energy community. It is outside of Athens. And then the energy that is produced on site is metered with the energy that is consumed at the households or the offices or the buildings of the members that are within uh, the city of Athens. I understand that there is some sort of energy sharing scheme in Portugal, but I think it's much more contained geographically. I don't know, uh, Susanna, if you want to intervene right now and correct me or... Uh, yes, I think, as I was saying, I think there's still lacking clarity on, the, on that can be implemented. Culatre is actually the first community testing out the, the sharing bit. Uh, so we're very much work in progress, working with the regulator and with the distributor to see how that can put in practice. But we're in the kind of uh, testing phase, so uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think generally energy sharing uh, and collective self-consumption is still in a very testing phase where 
the DSOs, the, the regulators, the suppliers are not yet complying with the regulation. So it's, it's a bit uh, of a wild west still all over uh, Europe, I would say. But still, uh, this, this model that we have in Greece, it's quite straightforward and quite attractive to explain to the members. Uh, because with current energy prices, basically you offset your investment in about 3.5 years. And the PV park has a lifespan of 25 years. So you become energy independent. You don't have to pay energy for 25 years. That's electricity. That is not uh, all sorts of energy. Um, yeah. And I think it's always quite important when communicating these kinds of things, whether there is the business model of the energy community or just generally the work that you do to back it up with some nice and clear visuals. Um, so that, that has really helped us with, with Hyperion, but also with the other energy communities that we're supporting in Greece. Um, it's good to keep in mind that the, there's all sorts of public financing tools that are becoming available all over Europe. Um, in fact, RescuePU did this mapping work uh, looking at how 19 countries, including Portugal, are using the, uh, the recovery and resilience funds, cohesion funds, and modernization funds to support energy communities. And uh, Portugal is planning to, uh, to support them, uh, including through cohesion and uh, RRF funds. So look at what's available in terms of public finance. And of course, there's all sorts of other uh, available platforms, including um, national funding schemes, the Netherlands, uh, Adonia showed us, showed us these examples of these very big wind parks and solar parks. Of course, usually these are not available to citizens to finance by themselves. So that's why in the Netherlands, for example, there's a very famous realization fund where uh, the government steps in and gives a very big loan of up to 1 million euros, if I'm not wrong. Uh, Adonia, correct me if I'm wrong, to energy communities to, to, to set up their projects. And of course, with smaller projects, if it's, I don't know, a small PV installation on the rooftop of a kindergarten or a public building, um, there's always, uh, we don't have to talk about investments, we can talk about crowdfunding. Uh, in fact, together with Rescoop, Electra has run a couple of successful crowdfunding um, campaigns to help starting uh, community energy projects in Albania and Serbia. So there's always um, ways you can mobilize the community energy network in Europe to, you know, to give back, to, to help each other out. Um, it's always small to, it's always it's small. It's always important to, to start small and realistic and to network. Uh, the point that I was saying before, as a community energy movement, we're facing many obstacles, but as long as we're helping each other out into these spaces, as long as, you know, the, the Greeks come together with the Portuguese and the Belgians, and, you know, there's all these links and we share the problems and we listen from each other and we collectively advocate, that's how we achieve change. And I think that's why the, the work of Rescue PU is quite important in the, in the sense that it's putting together members from across Europe to advocate at the Brussels level and then also sometimes at the national levels. And of course, the sky's the limit. Uh, I will say for the third time, excuse me for that. But uh, again, what Adonia said is extremely important, that it's not just about producing and consuming energy. It's about creating a community, a community that can have other business models, but can also um, engage in education. They can engage, they can create working groups. Um, our energy community, Hyperion, very recently created these uh, four working groups on energy poverty, on housing renovations, on social engagement, and on new technologies to really try to engage the members outside just the, the core, you know, board of directors, but try to engage more members voluntarily. And um, this is, again, to, to show you that it doesn't just have to be solar panels. Uh, in central Greece, we, uh, as Electra, we're supporting an energy community that is utilizing biomass to produce uh, bio pellets and uh, basically uh, produce sustainable heating solutions. And of course, there's another uh, energy community we're supporting in the island of Crete that is providing consulting services around energy efficiency and uh, public building renovations. And I will skip this for the sake of time. It's, uh... But what I want to say, uh, and I guess this is coming towards the end of the presentation, is that um, for me, the most important thing about energy communities is that they offer a way to re-energize uh, democratic participation, 
to really push for collective climate action um, and remind us that it's cool to take part in the commons. It's cool to um, really make our voices heard. And this is what we should be doing as young people, demanding uh, our space, demanding a seat at the table. And at the same time, tackling the growing apathy that we're seeing, especially amongst young people towards politics. And actually with this, with this occasion, I do want to ask you, um, raise your hand, put the, the function of raising your hand on the on Zoom. If you knew that there's a European election happening uh, next June, in June 2024. Well, it's it's fair to say some of the folks here are not European, so <laughs> it's also good to, to have that in mind. Yeah, that's a good point. But um, it's good to see still that uh, there's quite a lot of people. Uh, and now feel free to, to lower your hands. Um, use this as a first well those of you that are european please use this as the first opportunity to to mark your calendars and to remember to vote because a lot is at stake a lot is on the table um the next european election it's going to be about uh, countering the, the rise of the far right it's going to be about putting in a european parliament and a new commission that is going to implement the european green deal all of the files uh, all of these policies that are going to get us to net zero as fast as possible. I would say the latest by 2040. Um, so really, uh, it's very, very important that we uh, stay engaged. And I think uh, this is the last comment point, actually, that I want to make, that sometimes, you know, if we wait for the government to act, it will be too late. If we act as individuals, it will be too little. But if we act as communities, it might just be enough. And as communities, we can educate each other, we can empower each other, we can find that inner self-empowerment, as uh, Adonia was uh, saying this. Um, and really, I just want to close off by saying, uh, pat yourselves on the back, because uh, all of us here are trying to create a new energy system, which means also a new social and economic system, and that's not a small thing. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for, for working to find these alternatives um, all together. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks a lot for being with us here today. And I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Very nice and enthusiastic presentation. <laughs> it's what we needed to close the day. Um, so I'll now open up for, for questions. Thankfully, we have time this, this, in this session for, for questions, which is also good. Any questions, feel free to open up the mic or um, ask the question on uh, on the chat if you can't uh, speak now and I'll, I can I can pose the question for you. I think your steps were so clear that if people are already thinking <laughs> are they gonna start one? <laughs> Chris, so if there are no questions, I guess I'll... Uh... Katarina, you gonna ask one? Sure, yes. Go ahead, I've spoken too much. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just curious because I always like to hear, you know, from experience things. So I'm curious, Chris, if you, if you can think of like a couple of like challenges that you faced during uh, developing Hyperion and making it legal and so on throughout the process, and maybe like a couple of the wins that really make you, you know, feel good about it or I don't know, give you the extra push when you need it. I would say that uh, one, two big, um, for me right now, these are the two most important ones. Uh, challenges is the, so in Greece, we have the regulatory framework in place. I was explaining it, you know, you can create a solar, like a, a renewable energy installation and then collectively consume the energy from that. And then theoretically, that framework actually obliges uh, both the DSO and the supplier to, to transfer the energy and to, to credit this energy onto your bill. And although energy communities have started creating projects, and that's great, that speaks to what the second question you had, Katerina, you know, what gives us uh, power, what gives us motivation that we're seeing energy communities all over Greece. Um, there is actually 44 megawatt of capacity of installed or under development 
collective self-consumption projects by energy communities right now in Greece, which is quite a lot. And I'm not even counting uh, the rooftop solar panels. I'm not even counting um, energy communities that have projects to sell the energy. I'm just talking about uh, communities that are for self-consumption. Uh, so really, you see that it's it's becoming quite wi widespread, but still, uh, these communities with the self-consumption projects, they're not seeing the reductions in their energy bills because the suppliers are not complying with the regulation. So every time, you know, there's a, another and another and another uh, bureaucratic hurdle or, um, let's say, a lack of cooperation by the state or the big market actors that are supposed to facilitate that. Um, I guess that's my that's my question. That's both the, the motivation and the and the challenge. Uh, thanks, thanks, Tris. We have a question from Anna. Um, she's asking, and how do the big energy companies participate in these projects? Maybe I don't know, Adonia, as well. If you want to take this, but I'll briefly uh, give you the pass and say that um, actually that that was the example that Adonia uh, brought forward. That as the market becomes more liberalized which in one, one way is good because it allows for the participation of citizens and for the decentralization, the democratization. There's many of these energy companies that are stepping in, like, for example, uh, Iberdrola in Spain, um, creating um, collective self-consumption projects locally. So installing the panels, you know, uh, producing clean energy, but it's not owned by the citizens. It's just still owned by the big companies and it's still the benefits still largely, the economic benefits still largely accrue. Uh, the, uh, the the distribution goes back to the to the big companies. So they are trying to appropriate the concept, which is what capitalism always does. It finds a way to appropriate the more radical elements uh, that pop up. And I don't know if Adonia, you want to say anything else on this? You said it uh, quite well, just to add indeed, like we, we've seen that uh, already before actually, um, the Clean Energy Package 2019, uh, there were some uh, businesses that uh, kind of, uh, you know, trying models of developing projects, giving the opportunity to citizens to buy a share, but it was not really a share because the share comes with participation in the decision making. So in fact, it was just like a financing projects, most often solar projects, or some initiatives uh, also wind projects, but without necessarily giving the opportunity to have the community. So we've had in the past already uh, projects that might be, let's say, uh, partly financed by the citizens, but the citizen was not involved at all uh, in the overall management. But now, now, fast forward to where we are now, uh, we see that exactly because, as Chris mentioned, there is a lot of opportunities, uh, quite some uh, support coming, financial support, uh, especially coming up from the EU level. Now we see more and more uh, attempts, uh, luckily not with the same speed in different uh, contexts, let's say, uh, across the EU. Uh, we see more attempts of uh, um, businesses trying to indeed uh, imitate let's say uh, the model pretend that this is a project that is like a community led while it's just like uh, all this community washing you know like uh, you pretend that you're a community but in fact you are only maybe involving some financial uh, uh, through a financial way uh, the citizen Thanks for the very interesting answers. I think that that's just to, yeah to illustrate that just ticks one of the boxes that actually we're we're talking yesterday in the academy of the different types of ownership that you can have in a in an energy community and that the cooperative represents that very well. The legal, uh, the physical aspect, and in terms of the infrastructure where it's placed, the economical, the policy, and the social. So um, by co-opting this concept of it, of course they're giving they're giving equity in terms of, of the financing of the of the project, but that's that's about it. And it's very convenient because you can call it community project and get the, the funding for it, but the um, the actual benefits that would come from involving people are 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 not that at all. So um, that is happening a lot. You know, not in Portugal yet, because I guess we're still not on that stage of companies seeing the, the angle of, but it's going to it's going to become more of a thing. 
especially in one of the regions that we're talking here, this uh, one of the just transition regions where a large, uh, very large projects are being discussed and, and, try, and, and implemented um, without any kind of input from the communities. And I guess soon enough, they're gonna start labeling them as community and, and, and making it seem like it is. So I think that's the next stage for, for us here down, down south. Um, any more questions or comments to Chris and Antonia? Now we can open up for, for both of them. I've had some people joining in the, during the session. So uh, we're, as I said, we can have the recording uh, available. I see a question here from Bob. Hi, Bob. Bob is one of the participants from the last Energy Academy in uh, in Asia. It's from the Philippines. Just a quick question. He asks, how do we balance the need for funding in the community aspect of the centralized renewable energy? I don't know who wants to take that. Please, I would say, go ahead and then. No, I, I want to say that, uh, Adonia, you mentioned a couple of examples like Brixton Solar, which, but I will let you elaborate more on that. Um, maybe I can give the example of, um, it, yeah, just, just from the Greek example. Um, so when we talk about creating these collective solar parks, um, the good thing about them is that they offer a lot of flexibility in terms of the shares that someone can own in that park. Uh, so, for example, a, a low-income household uh, can own a very small share because they also don't have a lot of money to, to put in, but they also don't have a lot of energy needs. So they can just buy, let's say, 250 euros of a share. Whereas normally, if they had to install their own solar panel on the rooftop, that would have been, I don't know, more than 2,000 euros for, uh, let's say, two, three kilowatts. Um so there, there is that modularity and there is that flexibility. And also many uh, communities as well are uh, taking that into account, including EcoPower in Belgium, including Hyperion in Athens. They are giving some of the electricity that they produce for free to energy poor households. So that's, that's also good to keep in mind. Thank you, Chris. Antonio, do you want to add on something? Just, I mean, um... Very, I'll try to be quick. I mean, it's always like a balance because uh, we need to uh, ensure that we have uh, as much uh, support from the community side. But in certain occasions, uh, we actually need to, you know, reach out for external funds uh, to be able to develop the project. So uh, in uh, maybe I need to clarify because maybe I wasn't clear enough. So for instance, for the case of the cooperatives, the two cooperatives joining forces, uh, they, they had the loan uh, actually that they are uh, paying back. And in the, so they didn't have, in other words, they didn't manage to collect all the funding that was necessary by private, uh, you know, but the citizens investing in this, but they got a loan and they are paying back. And in fact, at some point they had the opportunity uh, because the investor, uh, in, in any case, uh, was giving them the opportunity to, to uh, step out, meaning that he, would, he was requesting some extra money for him to give more uh, ownership um, to the, uh, the communities. And this is what happened, actually, they increased the ownership now, uh, thanks to this. So, in short, uh, we will need to uh, get support from uh, other investors third parties, we will need to have some, uh, and in fact, we demand access to uh, private funding from the banks because it's not easy unless you have a, a number of projects to showcase your ability to develop another one. So uh, we will need to use these tools, but the goal is to eventually uh, use these external resources to support the community with what we were discussing and what Chris was saying, that to return uh, the, uh, any benefits to the local community. So that is why we need to, as an energy community, an energy cooperative, we need to keep having in mind the involvement of the local actors. And as Chris was mentioning, especially uh, people in more vulnerable, vulnerable uh, situation, uh, we need to always reach out and uh, try to support. And Actually, also the people in not vulnerable, let's say, situation, we need to keep them active. You know, we need to really, as Chris was saying, I like what he said, that you need to have someone 
focuses on the engagement and the activation of the community. This is critical. We don't want to be just the financial vehicle. No, we're talking about the community. Very good, very good point. Thank you both. Um, really, really made that more clear. I think Bob is happy with the answer. Uh, are there any more any more questions or comments for for Chris and Anthony? I think they left their contacts as well in the in the slides in case there's something else that comes up after, which usually does. Uh, hello. Uh, I don't... Uh, is there, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, hi to everybody. Uh, I I didn't uh, watch the beginning of your presentation, uh, but I have uh, one question and one comment, in fact, to um to what has been uh, said uh, now in this question park part um uh, uh, just to mention that uh in portugal at least um uh, i know that uh, some big companies uh, usually i think backed by financial companies uh, are proposing uh, the at least at the level of uh, the installation of the solar uh, photovoltaic uh, equip equipment, they uh, they propose uh, a plan so that uh, people or companies uh, can uh, install the all the uh, equipment in their roofs, and um, they propose to make. Uh, energy communities between like public buildings just to, to give you an example so uh, this to say that in portugal we already have um, companies of uh, a, a size that is uh, uh, big enough uh, in the in the energy community uh, market let's say yeah market because it's <laughs> it's being liberal liberalized um, I have also another question. Uh, it's a bit more technical, and I would like to know, like, in specifically for the Greek uh, example or any other examples uh, that that you might may, may know uh, around Europe. Um, at least in here, I know of a technical li limitation related to the fact that. Uh, uh, as not to, I'll try not to be too to go too deep into this, but you know that uh, the electrical network is uh, divided into, let's say, uh, tension or voltage levels, like the low tension uh, until like a thousand volts, uh, and then the medium, and then from there up. Um, between the low and the medium tension, we uh, there is usually the transformer. Uh, I was told that uh, you can only, in here at least, you can only implement uh, communities between like two or three buildings, let's say public buildings, that are in the same transformer. So if we have like uh, an area of a, of a city in, within a transformer and we have a building there, but then there is a building in some other area in another transformer, um, it is not uh feasible or it's not i think it's it's just a legal matter of course but because electrons you know <laughs> they will flow no matter what well well or we can at least access the amount of energy that is put in in what level of tension okay this is a bit technical but uh i would like to know if this is the case in greece or in any other country in in europe that you may know of thank you uh yeah, maybe I can start with the Greek and I don't know if you have anything to complement, please feel free. Um, yeah, what you're describing is the um, geographical limitations of energy sharing, which is uh, actually in most countries, it's what you're describing. So Spain and France have about a two kilometer radius. So it has to be more or less in the same substation. Um, I'm hearing that Portugal, I guess, is the same. In Greece, it's unique. I think in the world, not just in the European Union, that it's in a whole region. <laughs> so it's not the same substation, it's a whole region. Uh, and in fact, in Attica, which is uh, where Athens is, and it's the most populous region, it's the whole region and neighboring regions. <laughs> so it's really a very, very big geographical area where you can uh, do the energy sharing. 
Um, in certain countries like the Czech Republic, uh, it's still, or in Latvia or in, uh, yeah, in some other places, it's still just on the same building. So it's not even the same sub, sub, substation or uh, uh, two kilometers distance. Uh, so it really differs from country to country. But the idea is that all countries are now trying to to move towards the direction of, yeah, let's let's still keep it local, but not just the same building. Let's have it on a neighborhood or at least district level. Thank you. Obrigada, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm so happy that we're keeping the time and having time for questions. It's, it's really refreshing <laughs> to have time for, for discussion. Anyone else wants to add anything before we, we close for today? Uh, in the meantime, while you think of any, uh, any last minute questions, I just wanted to ask you to just uh, take a few couple of minutes just to um, just to ask a few questions, just uh, to help us understand a bit more how the session went. And uh, there's also a couple of other questions that relate more to the, to the folks here from, from Portugal. So I don't know, Antonia and Chris, if you want to add anything or, or Katarina before we close. Just very briefly, because I'm typing now, but I'm not fast enough. I shared the <laughs> link of our uh, transposition tracker. And in fact, we should add also the finance tracker, Chris. Um, we as Rescue BU, my colleagues, uh, have uh, looked into the developments of the policy landscape, let's say. What are the different developments across the EU when it comes to both the definitions, but also the uh, enabling framework and support schemes? And uh, what uh, the question of uh, Nuno, what uh, Chris also answered, is... Uh, partly, let's say, ask, uh, answered uh, through this, because indeed, uh, this is something that has been de designed at the policy level. Uh, I mean, at the national level, uh, the different uh, countries have uh, transposed uh, the directives and they made either uh, the life of citizens easier or less uh, easy, let's say. Because indeed, as Chris said, in some cases, we even have like uh, the, let's say, the bad practice, because we talk about good practice, but we have the bad practice of defining the level of uh, participation at the building. So not even uh, transformer level, building, <laughs> let's say. Uh, so, yeah, so, but this is uh, something that uh, as RescuePU we are pushing, uh, you know, to align, let's say, the, the transposition, the, the, the developments at the national level with the principle, let's say, and the, of uh, the directives, the European directives. That's all. And thanks a lot. Thanks a lot also for the questions. And apologies for my side, because I think I still spoke more than I should have. But uh, thanks for the discussion. It's always a fine balance in trying to share everything you, uh, you want to share and, and you know with, with making it uh, you know, uh, open enough for questions. So I think it boasted very well. Thank you, at least from my end. I really enjoyed spending uh, the last hour and a half with you. I think from where the reactions in the poll uh, that are still on, I think the, the participants feel the same. Uh, and well, I hope we, this is just the beginning of us working further, uh, Chris and Tonya. I mean, Tonya, we, we know each other for a long time, but Chris is the first time we, we sh at least share the screen. So maybe maybe the first, the first of many. Thank you so much again for taking the time in the evening and the participants as well. We left a few, um, a few resources that were left here on the, um, um, in the chat box. We will share the recording and I guess we can share the chat uh, as well. And then you can have access to, um, to all the information that was put there. Um, just as a final note, uh, as you know, and those that are here in the beginning and that have been in, in other sessions, there's still, uh, we just started the Youth Energy Academy. So this is kind of a, 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 larger, a larger activity within this project and uh, you can still join up if you want. We have a virtual component that goes uh, throughout October, a couple of sessions a week at the same time. And then at the end, we have a workshop session where we can have uh, visits, uh, a community energy project uh, in, in South of Portugal, and also have the chance to build uh, some of these systems with our own hands, which is very self-empowering, <laughs> putting the words of, uh, of Antonia, and very fun too. So um, I suggest that if, you, if you're in Portugal, 
and uh, if you speak Portuguese, because this academy is only is only in Portuguese, um, then feel free to still join us. Uh, but we will have uh, more news soon for uh, uh, for a more international audience uh, on the on the topic of academies. But more on that later. For now, I think it's seven o'clock. So if there are any more comments uh, or questions, I think we'll close up. And thank you so much again. Uh, and I hope to see you at least some of you again next week for the for the Youth Energy Academy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Keep in touch. Yes, let's keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.